you a murder my son, man, for nothing? You kept shooting him, man! You kept shooting him! What a bunch of f guys, you stupid piece of I'm gonna gag you in one second. You threatened my life, you fing I'll zip it. F you, you fing Anything you wanna add to your insanity? Suck my d We, the jury, in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Weldon K. McDavid, guilty of. Oh. This is Lucas Kendall, who's facing murder charges in Miami, Florida. In 2012, while working as a security guard at Club Lex, Kendall spotted two men taking in the parking lot. The 26-year-old approached them, and a confrontation took place. Kendall then unleashed a barrage of bullets on the two black men, killing 29-year-old Kijuan Bird and severely injuring his friend Michael Smathers, which left him permanently paralyzed from the waist down. Kendall was arrested and charged with second-degree murder and attempted murder. To evaluate his competency, Kendall was moved from the prison to a mental hospital, and his lawyer wanted to keep him there. And then the issue is that you want him housed where? At the same facility he's been housed. In order to prevent him from decompensating? Yes, Your Honor. He eventually decompensated to the point where he was sitting in a fetal position, naked, not eating, and not interacting with any human being. This is when things got crazy. Yeah, but my son is dead, man. My son is dead. He needs to go to prison. He don't need to be laying no no mental hospital. He need to, he need to go to prison, man. Come on, sir. He wanna play crazy. He wasn't he wasn't crazy when he killed my murdered my son, man. He wasn't crazy then, but he crazy now. All of a sudden he crazy now. You wanna lay in a mental hospital? The request to prevent Kendall from returning to jail became too much for the victim's father, Donald Bird. You do a murder my son, man, for nothing? When he was trying to get away from you, you was the, you, you was trying to get away from you, man. And you kept shooting him while his bike was under the truck. You kept shooting him, man. You kept shooting him. And his bike, his bike was tied to you, man. He was trying to get away from you. And you murdered him, man, like that. You murdered him, man, like that. The distraught father was escorted out of the courtroom, and Kendall was eventually deemed competent to stand trial. Well, the first thing we needed to address is he's been restored to competency. Correct, Your Honor. There are two evaluations from Dr. Luis Quintana and Dr. Richardson. They both find that he's competent. Kendall told the court he didn't want a lawyer and decided to represent himself. How is it that you expect to represent yourself? I'm not going to represent myself. I refuse to participate in the charade. I will refuse. I would advise you to do things the easy way. You wanted a trial. I don't want a trial. This is a charade. Okay. At his trial, Kendall attempted to use Florida's Stand Your Ground statute as his defense. So the trajectory coming from outside of the vehicle would have to come and that down the road. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you're referring to. But it failed to convince the jury, as Kendall was ultimately convicted of all charges and sentenced to life in prison without any chance of parole. While Lucas Kendall faced a grieving father's wrath in the courtroom, what happens when you attack the judge out of pure rage? The with the laws is hey. This is Deobra Redden, who's facing charges of attempted battery in Nevada. On April 18, 2023, 30-year-old Redden was arrested after he allegedly attacked his brother-in-law with a baseball bat. Redden pleaded guilty and faced a possible sentence of one to four years in prison. At his sentencing, Redden had a calm and matter-of-fact exchange with Clark County District Judge Mary Kay Holthus. Based on my history, like, I, feel, I feel that like, I shouldn't be like, sent to prison for a second time. Have you looked at your criminal history? Have you looked at your criminal history? Yeah, I actually just, um, I looked at it. I mean, you lived it, I suppose. I just looked at it, yeah. Yeah. Judge Holthus then reminded Redden of his criminal history. No. Three felonies, a gross, nine misdemeanors, multiple DVs. Got a lot going on, sir. Battery on a protected person, robberies, attempt home invasion. Redden, who struggled with mental health issues like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, tried to convince the judge that he deserved a second chance. I learned from my mistakes, you know? You know, I, I feel like I shouldn't be sent to prison, but if it's appropriate for you, then you have to do what you have to do. But I figured that 
I'm not hip. I'm in a better place in my life. I'm not doing drugs. I'm not, you know, I'm not out there committing crimes now. You know, and I feel like I should be given a shot. But Judge Holthus was having none of it. I appreciate that, but I think it's time that you get a taste of something else because I just can't with that history. This is when the defendant went nuts. Words with the laws is. Redden launched over the courtroom bench and headed straight for Judge Holthus. Eventually, deputies were able to restrain him. There was sheer chaos in the courtroom as alarms went off in the background and people started calling for help. That's affirmative medical is requested. Judge's chambers. Yeah, be advised. My 15's got a big laceration to his head. Judge hit her head into the wall and I got an inmate uh, that's bleeding up here. That's going to be a positive transport to uh, UMC. I'm also going to need a biohazard clean up for a lot of blood on the floor. Thankfully, Judge Holthus was not seriously injured. Later, it was revealed that Redden had punched the judge several times and pulled out parts of her hair. However, one marshal had to be hospitalized and needed 25 stitches after suffering a forehead injury, as well as a dislocated shoulder. A few days later, Redden was seen in court again, heavily shackled and wearing a spit mask to learn his fate. For his initial assault case. All right, this is on for the continuation of Mr. Redden's sentencing. I want to make it clear that I am not changing or modifying the sentence I was in the process of imposing last week before I was interrupted by defendant's actions. All right, that being said, in accordance with the laws of the state of Nevada, this court does now sentence you 19 to 48 months in the Nevada Department of Corrections. Additionally, Redden faced 13 new charges for the attack on Judge Holthus, including attempted murder, battery, and extortion by threat. Count one, attempt murder, victim 60 years of age or older, a felony. Count two, battery on a protected person resulting in substantial bodily harm, victim 60 years of age or older, a felony. Count three, extortion by threat, a felony. If convicted, he could spend decades behind bars. While Diobro Redden took out his anger on an unlucky judge, what happens when a convict confesses while defending himself in court? I did kill three y'all men. If you think I'm here to play around with y'all, y'all don't know. Like in the case of Ronnie O'Neill, who's on trial for two murders in Florida. According to reports, 29-year-old O'Neill fatally shot his then-girlfriend Kenyatta Barron at their Riverview home in 2018. Following this, O'Neill murdered his own daughter by striking her multiple times with a hatchet. She was only nine. O'Neill also stabbed their eight-year-old son before pouring gasoline all over the house and setting it on fire. Ronnie O'Neill III is accused of killing his girlfriend, her daughter, and then stabbing his own son in Riverview. O'Neill was arrested upon fleeing the burning house. Deputies also tell us they found a man named Ronnie O'Neill III inside the home smelling like gasoline. They had to use a taser to take him down. The son was able to escape, but suffered critical stab wounds and burns. The first 911 call that night came from Barron, who was heard screaming before suddenly hanging up. Eight minutes later, another call came in from O'Neill. Hey, I just been attacked by some white demons. Inside, with inside Kiki. Kiki, her name is Kiki. And she tried to kill me. And what she asked? Huh? After his arrest, O'Neill was psychologically cleared to represent himself in court.
Mr. O'Neill, you need to speak audibly so that the jury can hear what you're saying. Yes, ma'am, I haven't begun yet. I was talking to my father. Because if you think I'm here to play around with y'all, got on that. All right, Mr. O'Neill, please stop using um, swearing language. It's not appropriate in a closing argument. At his trial, O'Neill cross-examined his now 11-year-old son, whom he had stabbed, to which the son explained everything that happened. I just saw my dad holding a shotgun and my mom, like, and mom screaming at him. Did he do something to your sister? Yes, he, uh, hit her with an axe. And then he went in the garage, I followed him. He put, like, he put me on the ground, and then he, like, had his foot on top. I was laying in my stomach, he had his foot on top of me, and he was holding me down. And he was like lighting a match. Mr. O'Neill, any questions? How you doing, Ryan? Good. It's good to see you, man. Good to see you too. Did I hurt you that night of this incident? Yes. I did. And how did I hurt you? You stabbed me. O'Neill also accused the prosecution of fabricating evidence. And the evidence is going to show that law enforcement tampered with evidence to meet their such high burden of proof. He showed you a fraudulent recording where they alleged that I beat Kenyatta Barron to death. Before finally confessing to the murder. I did kill Kenyatta Bannon. To no one's surprise, the jury found O'Neill guilty of first-degree murder. Uh, we, the jury, found as follows as a count two of the charge. The defendant is guilty of first-degree murder, premeditated murder, and felony murder. At his sentencing, O'Neill showed no remorse for his actions. I am not sorry for something I didn't do, and I am not sorry for the things I did do. Judge Michelle Sisko said this was the worst case she had ever seen. 19 years I've been at this job. I've seen human beings killed at the hands of others in every way imaginable. You name it, I've seen it. This is the worst case I have ever seen. For the rest of my life, I'll be haunted by what I saw as far as the evidence. Ultimately, O'Neill was sentenced to three consecutive life terms without parole plus 90 years for the brutal murders of his daughter and girlfriend. As count one, Mr. O'Neill, I will adjudicate you guilty, sentence you to life in prison with a minimum mandatory of life in prison without the possibility of parole. As for his son, he was later adopted by the officer who cared for him on the night of the murders. While Ronnie O'Neill's actions traumatized even the most seasoned judge, what happens when the judge has to throw a convict out of the courtroom for his outbursts? What a bunch of ass, you stupid piece of awesome. You threatened my life, you Like in the case of Alan McCarty, who's facing charges of making death threats to a judge in Daytona Beach, Florida. In 2018, the Volusia County Sheriff's Office received an anonymous call. Communications, Warhurst. Yeah, I want to report a crime that's about to happen. What do you mean a crime that's about to happen? Yeah, there's about to be a crime that's going to happen if my kids don't come back to me, you stupid Because your stupid judges don't want to bring people to courtrooms. I got a gun pointed at your building. Sir, what is going on? Who the are you calling, sir, you stupid Where's your judge warrant at? You're going to bring that out in handcuffs and I'm going to execute that son of a right in the street. I'm letting you know I'm going to shoot this you got to give me my kids. Where are you at, sir? I just told you I'm outside of her building waiting for her to get there in the morning. I'm going to pop a cap in that You stupid The man was later identified as 36-year-old Alan McCarty, who falsely accused Circuit Judge Stasha Warren of taking his children away in a child custody case. Months later, McCarty was in court to answer for his crimes. At his pretrial hearing, McCarty spent every moment in court with profanity-filled rants, so Judge Matt Foxman gave him a warning. I'm going to tell you to be quiet, and you need to be quiet. There's not going to be a second time. If there's a second time, I'm going to duct tape. Huh? 
But that seemed to trigger him even more. I'm going to tell you, you just threatened my life to duct tape me. Did everybody just hear that? You just threatened to duct tape me? Really? In the courtroom, a judge just threatened to duct tape me. Oh, I said I'm You old. just said on record you're going to duct tape me. McCarty continued to disrupt the proceedings. No, I refuse. No, no, I refuse. I refuse. He threatened to duct tape me. He threatened to duct tape me. I refuse. I didn't threaten. Yes, you did. You admitted it on on, on the thing. I, I sca I'm scared. I said if you don't behave, then you're gonna duct tape me. I'm scared. Been removed from this room. The judge threatened my life. You have a I am scared. I want to be removed. If if you don't, I would like to be removed from this room. The judge threatened my life, and I want to press charges. I want to be removed. Thank you. See you on Thursday for your trial. Then at his trial, McCarty was back to his belligerent best. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not under oath. All right, raise your right hand. I'm going to swear you in. I'm not under oath. Raise your hand, please. That's a bad finger. I didn't appreciate that. But go ahead. I'm going to swear you in. Still going to threaten me like you did the other day? I am not under oath. This is being done unconstitutionally. These all took my kids unrightfully. You won't allow my witnesses here. He was Quit wasting my time and bring him in. Holly, make sure you take down what I said. Yes. He was sworn in. On no, I was not sworn in. Yes, I've yes. never been sworn in this court. Bring the camera back. He's making this up. He's representing. He is making this up. I was never sworn That's in. I have not been sworn yes. in at all. You're, doing You're a right. liar. Judge Foxman calmly asked McCarty if he wanted to be present in the courtroom. Um, number one, I need to know whether or not you want to be here during the trial process. No. All right. Do you want to testify, though? Does no, I don't. This is all being done unconstitutionally, unrightfully. Y'all are f***ing. You ain't allowing my evidence. You ain't allowing my people. But the foul-mouthed defendant continued to insult the judge and his staff. Oh, um, my daddy owns the building and I look like a f***. Yes, huh? Brought your dress today, you little prick. You wanna take my kids from me and act like that? You in that? You loud with me? Is that what you're gonna do? No. Well then, do it again. Come on, shut the. Up. I'm trying to think over here. Unsurprisingly, McCarty was removed from the courtroom and sat in a separate room. Take all my paperwork so you, I can't show these people. You want to take all my paperwork from me? Lock me in a cell naked all night? However, that room was not soundproofed. As opposed to... No, okay. Sorry, we got to do the first I've chosen that room as opposed to duct tape. He can watch and hear what we're doing. Eventually, McCarty was convicted of threatening a sitting judge. The following month, McCarty returned for sentencing, showing no signs of change or remorse. You threatened the uh, unborn child of the prosecutor um, directly in an open What a court. bunch of guys, you stupid piece of then also You threatened my life, you fing In the uh. you, you fing Back room. Suck my Needless to say, McCarty was once again sent to the back room. No, I'm not standing. Not resisting. I'm not resisting. I'm just not standing. Stand up. I'm not standing. I don't have to stand. I hope you fall on that baby's head, you stupid I never threaten that bitch. Freak, play back the shit, you stupid mother Where he continued his profanity-filled rants from behind a mirror. Ultimately, McCarty was sentenced to 20 years in prison for his threats to kill Judge Warren. While Alan McCarty's explosive courtroom demeanor certainly didn't earn him any brownie points, what happens when you attack the judge out of pure rage? Like in the case of Melissa Hardwick, who was in court for a domestic violence hearing in Kentucky. 
Back in 2011, Hardwick's ex-husband had filed a domestic violence order against her. And are you asking the court to enter an order restraining the respondent from any contact with you? He was explaining the situation when Hardwick started to interrupt the proceedings. Things have been escalating, I guess, since the first of the year. And uh, Melissa's had a couple of MIWs and a couple uh, arrests. And she got out of jail in, I guess, April. And she started, she started, we hadn't really had anything personal up until that point. She got out of jail in April and she started. Our personal life is no, no. business. At first, Judge Jennifer Edwards gave the defendant a warning. Has nothing to do with Ms. Hardwick, no. you will be held in contempt of this court if you I become don't, disruptive. I don't care. But Hardwick did not care. So the judge had her arrested for contempt and sentenced her to 10 days in jail. I haven't done anything to this court. I haven't done anything to okay. him. She will be arrested for contempt any, of the court. Make any difference. You will serve uh, 10 days for contempt of court. This is when things got really crazy. Oh, no. Hardwick leapfrogged and reached out to get her hands on the judge, but thankfully court deputies stepped in just in time. However, that didn't stop Hardwick's verbal threats. She faced additional criminal charges for her antics. I knew Judge will have to be appointed to represent because she will be charged criminally for the threats that were made in open court today. Eventually, Hardwick was sentenced to 120 days in prison for her outburst. While Melissa Hardwick's attack was stopped in the nick of time, what happens when you claim to follow Satan's orders to murder someone? No, like in the case of Leonid Greiser, who's on trial for murder in Russia. As per reports, 18-year-old Greiser killed his sister at their apartment in Moscow, claiming that Satan had ordered him to do it. Greiser was found naked with his sister's body covered with demonic symbols painted with blood. During questioning, Greiser was seen smiling and free of remorse. Greiser asserted that he had to kill his sister to get rid of the doubts he had in himself. Police also found drugs at his apartment, which might have been a contributing factor, but Greiser said he was aware of what he was doing. In court, Greiser was put behind a glass cage to prevent him from escaping. But the defendant had other ideas. When his first attempt to escape was thwarted, Greiser took the high road. He somehow managed to squeeze through the roof of the cage and tried to escape through the false ceiling of the courtroom. Stunned officers desperately tried to get the escaping prisoner. One of them managed to pull his pants down, but struggled to hold Greiser. Finally, more officers arrived and threatened to tase the suspect. Дайте руку! Дайте руку! 
Дайте руку. Чё? Дайте мне руку. Что я говорю? Нажми, бля. Куда нажать? Дайте руку. Сейчас, я тебе дам руку. Eventually, Greiser gave up and crawled back into his glass cell and was asked to pull his pants back up. When the dust settled, Greiser was handcuffed to prevent any more shenanigans. Ultimately, a judge sentenced Greiser to compulsory psychiatric medical treatment every six months. While Leonid Greiser failed to escape the law, what happens when you decide to insult your victims' families? Like in the case of T.J. Lane, who was on trial for murder in Ohio. Lane was 17 when he opened fire at his Chardon High School on February 27, 2012, gravely injuring several students. Authorities were flooded with panic-stricken 911 calls. 911, where is your emergency? We just had a, we just had a shooting at our school. We need to get out of here. Oh my okay. God, a okay. Do you have any idea where the shooter is? He started in the cafeteria. He started in the cafeteria. Yeah, and he ran out. Okay. Who was the shooter? Uh, his name is Thomas Lane. After Lane opened fire in the cafeteria, the school's assistant football coach, Frank Hall, chased him outside. That's where the police found Lane when they arrived and arrested him. Tragically, 16-year-old Daniel Parmator died at the scene while Russell King Jr., 17, and Demetrius Hewlin, 16, later succumbed to their injuries at the hospital. The shooting also left 17-year-old Nick Waltzak permanently paralyzed. All of Lane's victims were his classmates. Lane was charged as an adult with three counts of murder. As for the accused shooter, T.J. Lane has been charged with three juvenile counts of aggravated murder. His friends said the teenager was often quiet and kept to himself. He was just a person that, like, wanted to hide himself and keep all of his emotions in. The kind of guy that, like, would sit by himself and just never bother anybody. Reports also suggested that Lane had a deeply troubled home life. His father had previously served in prison on assault charges, while his mother often stayed away from home. Lane initially pleaded not guilty on the grounds of insanity, claiming he heard voices in his head on the day of the shooting. But eventually, the defendant was found competent to stand trial. So, to avoid the death penalty, Lane pleaded guilty to the murders. You understand that you're pleading guilty. You are pleading guilty to the three aggravated murder charges with the firearm specifications. Yes, Your Honor. At his sentencing, Lane showed no signs of regret as the victim's family members addressed their child's killer. That child stole my baby's life, and he should never be able to do this to anyone ever again. I will have to eventually forgive you, otherwise you will haunt me. You will never ever be in my thoughts after this. Never. I want you to endure years and years of pain and abuse, which is in my opinion not harsh enough. Lane's lack of remorse was more evident when he arrived for his sentencing. He started executing his sinister plan by unbuttoning his shirt and revealing a white t-shirt with the word KILLER scribbled on it. Lane, who wore a similar t-shirt on the day of the shooting, showed it off in the courtroom with a smug smile on his face. And if that wasn't enough for the victim's family members sitting in the gallery, this is what the evil killer had to say to them. Ultimately, 
Lane was sentenced to life in prison without any chance of parole for the murder of his classmates. While T.J. Lane's sickening courtroom insults left everyone stunned, how does it compare to soiling your own lawyer in court? You just gave him four years. Well, guess what? Sir, like in the case of Ricky Hand, who's facing multiple charges of robbery in Ohio. Late one night in April 2016, the owner of John's drive through was preparing to end his shift. Unknown to him, his business was about to be targeted. 46-year-old Hand, a known career criminal, attempted to rob John's drive through that night. But he was in for a surprise. The store owner saw Hand approaching on the security camera and was armed and ready. The man shot at hand multiple times as the perpetrator fled the scene. The owner then called 911. 911 emergency. Yeah, this is John's drive through West Main Street. A uh, guy just tried to rob me and I shot him. He ran out the back door. Okay, is he injured? I, I think I hit him. Police arrived and traced hand to a nearby hospital where he was arrested. Hand later confessed to the robbery attempt. I did try to rob John's driver. He got shot three times. I did the crime, I ain't even gonna lie. I, mean, I just wanted to leave. He also admitted his involvement in a series of other robberies. There have been probably a half a dozen or more robberies. Now you're looking at John's, you're looking at this break into this beauty salon. That's all I've done. The beauty salon's a bonus because I didn't even know anything about that, and you told me that. I'm going to prison for a long time. Well, you know that. Eventually, Han pleaded guilty to seven robbery-related charges and was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Did you just give me 40 years, sir? Yes. Han was clearly expecting a lesser sentence, and what he did next shocked the entire courtroom. You just gave me 40 years. Well, guess what? Sir, just say this hand. After learning his fate, Hand proceeded to fling hidden pill bottles filled with feces and urine at his own lawyer before being detained by court officers. Due to his antics, Hand faced additional charges of harassment with bodily fluids, obstructing justice, and retaliation. While Ricky Hand's biohazard bomb certainly left the courtroom in disgust, what happens when you taunt a grieving father in court? Like in the case of Michael Madison, who's on trial for multiple murders in Ohio. According to reports, Madison kidnapped and killed three women in 2013 before dumping their bodies in plastic bags near his home in East Cleveland. It was a call about a bad smell that led police to this abandoned home and garage. Two of the bodies were found here. The third victim was found in an overgrown field about 100 yards away. Police also found decomposed human remains at his apartment. There was uh, evidence of uh, decomposition fluid in several parts of the apartment building. Uh, there were maggots that were attached to the decomposition fluid. There were uh, some trace uh, decomposition fluid on the walls uh, coming out of the kitchen to the doorway. Madison was arrested and charged with three counts of aggravated murder. If convicted, he could be facing the death penalty. Michael, you got anything to say? Got anything to say to Anthony so well? We hear that uh, you're, a, he's a, you're a fan of his. At his trial, the defense claimed the killings were spontaneous and in the heat of the moment. That each one of these individuals was killed with a sudden eruption of violence. He made no effort to bury these bodies and really conceal them, despite the fact that they're in fairly obvious areas, the fact that they were malodorous, the fact that people were complaining about the smell. But the prosecution argued that Madison's actions were calculative and premeditated. He killed them in the same way, at the same place, and in a short time frame. Then he disposed of their bodies 
to avoid detection from his crimes, he tied two of the victims up with duct tape, placing their legs on each side of their head and binding and bending the body in half. Eventually, Madison was found guilty of all charges as the victim's family members cried tears of joy. The families of Michael Madison's victims cried tears of joy. At his sentencing, Van Terry, a victim's father, addressed his daughter's killer. He looked straight at Madison as the defendant grinned at him off camera. This is when Terry exploded. Fortunately, Terry was quickly apprehended and taken out of the courtroom. He did not face any additional charges. A short while later, Judge Nancy McDonald addressed the court. I am struck by the sheer inhumanity of what one human being can do to not one but three human beings. She called the murders an act of sheer inhumanity. You went on to abuse the corpses of these three victims. You stripped them from the waist down. You folded them in half, binding them so that their feet were up by their ears. You wrapped them in multiple layers of trash bags and you discarded them. Finally, it was time for the serial killer to learn his sentence. Accordingly, the sentence of death is imposed upon the defendant, Michael Madison, on counts 1, 4, and 7. Ultimately, Michael Madison received the death penalty. He will live on Ohio's death row. While Van Terry's courtroom leap was truly spectacular, what happens when you flip off the judge? Come back again. Come back again. Bring him back again. Like in the case of Penelope Soto, who's facing charges of drug possession in Miami, Florida. In 2013, Soto was arrested after she crashed her bike on Southwest Street while high on Xanax. Police also found 26 Xanax bars in Soto's purse. The next day in court, Soto showed signs of being intoxicated as she giggled, touched her hair, and appeared to stagger. I don't know I'm going to appoint you because you own a lot of substantial amounts of jewelry. You can go and sell your jewelry. Jewelry for a private attorney. What is the standard bond? To determine her bail conditions, Soto was asked about her assets. Ms. Soto, are you working? Yes. How much money are you making a week, approximately? Approximately about 200 bucks a week. Okay, and do you own any property of value? A house, a car, a bank account, significant amounts of jewelry? Yes. What do you own? <laughs> I own a lot of jewelry, all right, okay. as well as a, go ahead. a car. Well, how, 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 how much you, would you say your jewelry is worth? <laughs> However, Judge Jorge Rodriguez Chomat did not like the defendant's attitude and gave her a warning. <laughs> it's not a joke, you know. We are not in, we are not in a club now. Okay, but it's you know. Hey, well, you see, you know, we, are not in a, we are not in a club. Be serious about it. I'm serious about oh, it. You're being you just very, made me I can laugh. see you're serious, all right. You just made me laugh. I apologize. While discussing the value of her jewelry, Soto even referenced Rick Ross, a rapper known to wear expensive bling. How much is your jewelry worth? It's worth a lot of money. Like what? Like Rick Ross. Huh? It's worth Ma money. Not making sense of her answers, the judge asked Soto whether she was under the influence. Have you had any kind of drugs in the, in the last 24 hours? Actually, no. Eventually, her bond was set at $5,000. What is the standard bond? It should be... It's going to be no PTS. Okay, 5000 on count one. Count one would be 5000 for our cost found. Bye-bye. Adios.
However, Judge Rodriguez Chomont was not going to tolerate Soto's sassy attitude anymore. <laughs> Come back, ma'am. Come back. Come back. Give me the paper again. The judge called her back and doubled Soto's bond to 10,000. This is when things got serious. Come one would be 10,000. While leaving the stand in disgust, Soto cursed at the judge and showed him the finger. Are you serious? I am serious. Adios. <laughs> this time, Judge Rodriguez Chomont was done playing games. Come back again. Come back again. Bring him back again. I believe I heard you saying to... Yes, I did. I'm not going to do it. I believe you... Did you say... Actually, I did. did. you say that? Yes, sir. I did. Oh, you did say that? I'm not I find you in direct criminal contempt. 30 days in the county jail. Soto was charged with contempt of court and sentenced to 30 days in jail. Four days later, Soto was back in court again, this time sober and apologetic. My behavior was very irrational and... I apologize not only to the court and you, but to my family. The judge saw the lighter side of it and revoked her sentence. I am going to vacate the judgment of contempt and also, also set aside, cancel, or end the remaining of your county jail sentence. A year after that, Soto's drug charges were dropped when she successfully completed a court-ordered drug program. While Penelope Soto's courtroom reactions could certainly be blamed on drug use, what happens when you attack an officer of the court? Like in the case of William Terry, whose sentencing was wrapping up at the Cuyahoga County Justice Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Terry just received an 18-month prison sentence for burglary and assault. Terry's family was present in the courtroom, sitting behind him, while the victim was seated across from them. As he was heading to prison, Terry turned to his family and gave them words of encouragement. All right, let's go. Get my family and my stuff out my pocket. Yeah. All right, it's all right. It's only 18 months. Then suddenly, he turned towards the victim and started abusing him. Hey, f you f This is when a deputy tried to pacify Terry, but the defendant attempted to headbutt the officer. Two deputies tried to control the situation, and more backup was called in. Eventually, Terry was removed from the courtroom without any further incident. He faced no additional charges for his outburst. While William Terry got off easy for his moment of madness, what happens when a murder-for-hire plot goes wrong? Like in the case of Diana Lovejoy, a YouTuber who conspired to murder her ex-husband in California. Reports suggest that in 2016, Lovejoy hired firearms instructor Weldon McDavid Jr. to assassinate her ex-husband, Greg Mulvihill. Lovejoy and Greg were reportedly going through a bitter divorce and custody battle at that time. McDavid allegedly lured Greg to a secluded area by pretending to have information that would help him with his case against Lovejoy. But when Greg arrived at the scene, several shots were fired at him. His friend called 911. Hello, this is 911. Uh, my friend has just been shot. Do you know who shot him? There's a guy lying down like a sniper. A sniper? Did you see him at all? Briefly, we saw the, the gun, and he shot at us like six or seven times. One of the bullets hit Greg, and he was fading fast. He's bleeding pretty black. My friend's getting lightheaded. That's okay. I got paramedics in route, okay? I have officers in route. I got help out to you, okay? When police arrived, they found Greg in his car, bleeding out. Greg was rushed to a nearby hospital, where he survived. Police learned the call that McDavid made to lure Greg to the shooting came from a burner phone, which was purchased by Lovejoy two weeks before the incident. She also allegedly paid the assassin $2,000.
Lovejoy was arrested and charged with attempted murder and conspiracy to commit murder. At her trial, Greg took the stand and described the chilling moments right before he was shot. After the second time of shining the light on it and staring at it for a second, I realized I was looking at a barrel and a scope of a gun. Eventually, the jury found Lovejoy guilty of all charges. This is when things started to collapse. We, the jury, in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Diana Jean Lovejoy, guilty. As the verdict was being read out, a loud thud echoed through the courtroom. It was Lovejoy's head hitting the table. We, the jury, in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Diana Jean Lovejoy, guilty of the crime of conspiracy to commit murder. Lovejoy had fainted out of shock and was sent to the hospital. Lovejoy was unconscious for a time, then taken to a hospital for treatment. A few months later, Lovejoy was back in court for her sentencing, where she made an emotional plea to the judge. I still care about Greg in as much as he. I did love him. I loved him a lot. And I really cared about him, and I still care about Greg. Ultimately, Lovejoy was sentenced to 26 years to life in prison. 26 years to life. And as for McDavid, he received a sentence of 50 years to life. While Diana Lovejoy collapsed in court after learning her fate, what happens when a robbery goes horribly wrong? Like in the case of Jaleel Smith Riley, who's facing murder charges in Ohio. In 2013, 23-year-old Smith Riley reportedly shot and killed 22-year-old Portia Brooks and injured her boyfriend Aaron Martin in a robbery gone wrong. Police say they were random victims of a robbery gone horribly wrong. A woman killed on a Norwood street, her boyfriend critically injured. Portia and Aaron were sitting in their car on Carthage Avenue in Norwood when Smith Riley and two others approached them with guns. Smith Riley ordered Aaron out of the car and when he didn't have any cash, shot him in the head, causing permanent brain damage. He then leaned into the car and fired at Portia. She died three days later. After the culprits escaped, a passerby called 911. There was a guy outside of the car who looked like he had, like he was bleeding from multiple spots. There's a lady in it and she's bleeding. Smith Riley was arrested and charged with both the shootings. To avoid the death penalty, Smith Riley pleaded guilty to aggravated murder and attempted murder. Since had a change of heart, would like to withdraw his guilty plea. At his sentencing, the victim's family members addressed their loved one's killer. But he killed me mentally, emotionally. He killed my identity as a mother of three, as a family of four. This is what I have left because of his greed, his selfishness, his complete disregard of and disrespect of others and life. This is what I have left. I, I talk to her, I kiss her, I hold her. But as you can see, I get nothing back except the reality that she is gone. Portia's sister asked for Smith Riley to be denied parole. He wants parole? Well, I want my sister. Let's train me. I have to deal with life without Portia, so he should deal with life without, without parole. Then Smith Riley approached the court and begged for a lenient sentence. <laughs> Go back I'm so sorry. His attorney also offered some final words. Somebody that feels genuine remorse. This is somebody that thinks about this every day, and he knows that he can't go back in time and undo what he did. Despite all the pleas, the judge stood firm. This is when the defendant lost it. As the judge sentenced Smith Riley, he broke down and collapsed. Four defendants serve a term of life without parole. As to count four, for the offense of attempted murder <laughs> Ultimately, Smith Riley received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. While Smith Riley's senseless actions destroyed a young couple's life, how does it compare to throwing a tantrum in court? Like in the case of Milton Watts, who's in court for failing to appear on a domestic violence charge. That's not anymore. That's 180. 
Things went off to a rough start when Judge Chris Green asked Watts about missing his court appearance. You were supposed to be here last month. You did not appear. Why weren't you here? Yeah, I had work. My mom didn't show up. Uh, somebody died in the family. There was no reason for me to be here. Well, it's not an engraved invitation, son. It's a court order. Judge Green initially showed some leniency. He asked Watts to hire a new lawyer since the previous one had withdrawn from the case. But the 21-year-old continued with a smug attitude. Your attorney withdrew, so you'll have to hire an attorney? I don't need an attorney. You're a lawyer? Nope. Yeah. You want to talk to me about me at Bond with me? What do you want to tell me? About what? Bond. Finally, Judge Green had enough. He charged Watts for showing contempt in the courtroom. That's going to cost you 30 days in the county jail for contempt. Cuff him if you got the cuffs. Hold on. It's $5,000 cash surety bond, temporary, subject to the temporary protection order. As the judge read out the charges, Watts started throwing a tantrum. He just swore at the judge. Judge Green tried to give him some counsel. Can I give you a piece of advice? What? You can either make life easy or you can make life hard. But Watts had other ideas. He continued his rant as Judge Green kept on adding to the charges. I already ruined my life. That's 60. You want to go for 90? That's 94. That's 180. That's 360. I'm working at McDonald's. Now I gotta come here and my life up. You, Melvin, stop. Watts' family members tried to intervene, but there was no stopping the foul-mouthed defendant. How many days should I give me now? Are you still counting? Yeah, I'm at about a year right now in contempt. So he's got mental problems. He's not on medication. I don't care. I don't give a you. Stop. Everybody. You. Melvin, stop. The power. The power. Finally. Backup arrived. Court deputies took Watts away as his family looked on with disappointment. I like your suit. Thanks, man. Melvin. Melvin. It's funny. Just let him do what you want. I'm not going to do anything. You just cause him more. That's ignorant. That's the way he is. He's shaking. While Judge Green initially went up to 365 days in the heat of the moment, once everything calmed down, Watts was sentenced to 90 days in prison. While Milton Watts will be spending less time in prison than he bargained for, how does it compare to getting your mouth shut with tape? Like in the case of Franklin Williams, who's facing charges for multiple robberies in Cleveland, Ohio. According to reports, Williams carried out a string of armed robberies in 2014. He then led state troopers on a high-speed chase, which resulted in the injury of an officer. Williams was charged with aggravated robbery, kidnapping, and unlawful possession. He initially pled guilty, but later withdrew his plea and fled the state. The local man was in his second trial back in December for armed robberies in the suburbs, and he showed up for the beginning of the trial, then disappeared, cutting off his ankle bracelet. Williams was eventually caught and later claimed that he didn't flee, rather lost his memory after an accident and forgot about the trial. Then, at his sentencing, Williams interrupted the proceedings over 60 times in 54 minutes, despite repeated warnings from Judge John Russo. I just met this attorney the other day. That's fine. So, and only so, so he here, is, yeah, so okay. I, I, I came and took my cell phones yesterday, and they came and took all my property out my, out my cell today. All my Mr. Williams, I'm the judge in the matter. Shut your mouth and I'll tell you when you could talk. You got it? But you're not letting me tell that you means what's going on. Zip it right now. You trying to Does that make sense? You will get a chance to talk. I'm gonna gag you in one second. So just listen to me. Here it is again. So you said to me you understand this comment. Zip it. Right now. Tell me black women just walked in here. Okay, so I have not been around. Let's go back here. I'll zip it. And the jury came back with the verdict. That's so, a violation of the hip law, Judge. Here we go. 
I'm going to tape it, me on and then I'll unzip it when I want you to talk. Finally, the judge had enough. He ordered court deputies to shut Williams up with duct tape. Mr. Williams, I want to make it real clear. If you spit on, attempt to bite, or injure any of my deputies, you're going to have a bad day. Oh, you clear. Put the tape on me, man. We done with this shit. Judge Russo later apologized for his decision and recused himself from the case. For gagging a defendant to keep order in the court, I apologize for taking that action last week. In his next sentencing hearing, Williams took the stand to plead his case. Saying freedom of speech, no duct tape. Your Honor, I ask today, Your Honor, that I receive the lightest sentence that you can give me. I want the world to know I am not an animal. Contrary to what people may think, I am a man. But given Williams' already long record before this particular crime, the judge sentenced him to 33 years in prison. And no, you're not an animal, Mr. Williams. You're a human being. But the question the court has to determine is whether or not you've learned from those mistakes. The judge made a rare move, allowing Williams to say goodbye to his mom before going to prison for 33 years. Before Williams left, he had some final words for the court. Freedom of speech, no duct tape. Freedom of speech, no duct tape. With the hashtag. While Franklin Williams' defiance of the law was certainly shocking, what happens when the judge condemns you to die? You were relentless, you stab, you stab, you stab, you stab, you stab, until he was dead. Like in the case of Camille Gamet, who's facing charges of open murder in Jackson, Mississippi. In 2013, 30-year-old Gamet reportedly stabbed and killed her boyfriend, Marcel Hill, at their home in Lansing Avenue. At her trial, the prosecution said Hill was stabbed 12 times and had his skull caved in with an iron pan. You end up probably in some kind of domestic, ultimately hit him in the head so hard with a pan that you actually cave in the front of his skull, and then you stabbed him no less than 12 times. The jury eventually convicted Gamut of first-degree murder. After a jury convicted her in March of first-degree murder for stabbing her boyfriend, Marcel Hill, in the spring of 2012. Now at her sentencing, Gamut was given a chance to apologize, but instead, she chose to plead her defense. Is there anything that you want to tell the court before I impose sex? Is there anything you want to tell the victim's family who sure, are here today? I just want to say that I stick by the truth, which is that I did react to self-defense. I did love Marcel and basically at trial, the way I was portrayed, everything, mostly everything was lies. There was a little bit of truth, but mostly I was convicted off of lies. However, Judge John McBain did not agree. Okay. Got it. Any, any, anything you want to tell the court about the 12 stab wounds that you did in self-defense? The alleged 12 stab wounds? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't think the pathologist lied about those. No, I don't have anything further to say. Gamut also showed no remorse when Hill's aunt took the stand. So we, the family of Marcel, would like to thank God for the special gift that you will receive today from the judge. Is that it? When I finish out what you know. Oh, okay. Mm. <laughs> Seriously? And the judge was having none of it. Just talk again. I'll have my court officer quiet, put a quiet. piece of duct tape in your mouth. You understand right. it? Try it one more time and see what happens to your mouth. You got something else to say? He warned Gamut of having her mouth shut with duct tape, but the defiant defendant continued to argue. I'm done. Miss Sonia, I'll, get, I'll get, 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 the, get the duct tape. I'll sit here and listen to the lies. You know what? She's got a right to talk to the court after you and murdered a relative of hers, and you're going to well, shut your mouth, or I'm going to have some duct tape put on it. Well, he's had All right. some... We'll wait here for a moment so we can get her quiet. Then... It was the prosecution who ripped into Gamut. We have no choice but to send her where she will also die. I can't believe she stands before you doing this this morning. Please. Finally, Judge McBain had the last words. This is one of the worst cold-blooded murders I've seen in a long time. You gutted him like a fish in that apartment, too. You were relentless. You stabbed, you stabbed, you stabbed, you stabbed, you stabbed until he was dead. With that explosive ending, Gamut was ultimately sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. I agree with the family. I hope you die in prison as well.
You know, and if this was a death penalty state, you'd be getting the chair. While Camille Gamet faced the judge's wrath in the courtroom, what happens when the judge threatens to rip up your plea deal? If you're convicted of felony murder, you'll go to prison for the rest of your life. That means you'll die there. That's what I'm tempted to do. Like in the case of Donta Wright, who's facing murder and robbery charges in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Wright was 17 when he shot and killed 18-year-old high school football athlete Jordan Klee during an attempted robbery near his apartment complex. Two other teenagers were involved in the murder. Jamarius Ellison, 19, and Delrano Gracie, 18, both received 15 to 40 years in prison. As for Wright, he pleaded guilty to armed robbery, conspiracy to commit armed robbery, felony firearms charges, and second-degree murder. Armed robbery, count three, conspiracy to commit armed robbery, count six, the felony firearm, and an added count seven of murder in the second degree, under pack code 750.317. Wright then went on to casually describe the chilling details of the murder. Did you agree and conspire with two other individuals, Delvino Gracie and Jamarius Ellison, to commit an armed robbery? Yeah. And who are you going to rob? Jordan Clee. Jordan Clee. And as a result of that armed robbery, um, what did you do with that gun and Mr. Jordan Clee? Shot him. And where did you shoot him? On the top. Isaiah. And did, did you kill him with that shot? Yes. At his sentencing, a family member spoke on behalf of the victim's mother, who was too overcome with emotion to speak. I've lost laughter and love. I no longer have the hope of having grandchildren. I've lost the enjoyment of holidays and birthdays and of everyday life. This year was supposed to be a year of celebration, of senior pictures with prom and graduation and parties. Instead, it was a nightmare, a nightmare that no parent should ever endure. The teenager showed no remorse and smiled throughout the statement. In court after an admitted killer is caught on camera smiling during his sentencing. Wright then addressed the court, where he continued with his indifferent demeanor. I just want to tell y'all, I'll be home soon, RRP Keon, I love my family. Yes. But the judge was having none of it and threatened to reject the defendant's plea deal. You know, I have um, never in 20... Three years of approximately ever not accepted a sentence agreement between the parties because it's a bargain for sentence by the parties. But watching you sit there, smile and laugh and shake your head like this was no big deal, I'm very tempted to just say, I'm not going to accept this sentence agreement. We'll go to trial. And if you're convicted of felony murder, you'll go to prison for the rest of your life. That means you'll die there. That's what I'm tempted to do. Mr. Bella, do you want me to accept this sentence agreement? Now it was up to the prosecution to decide whether or not to dismiss the agreement and pursue a trial. Uh, with the victim's mother as well as his grandparents and uh, some family members, uh, they understand that obviously this, this is the defendant who uh, brutally uh, murdered their son by shooting him in the back of the head. He's shown absolutely no remorse. And throughout the victim impact statements today, he, he smiled and, and laughed uh, throughout the entire proceeding. Um, However, the Klee family um, does want to move on with this. They want to get some closure from this case. And they want to try and forgive this defendant and all of his actions uh, for what he did. And they are asking, as well as the people, uh, that you proceed with the sentencing. Okay. Wright got another opportunity to speak. This time, he addressed the court through his attorney. Your Honor, my client asked me to apologize to the court. His smiling was in no way meant as disrespectful either to the family to the victim or to this court. My client is 17 years old. He has some emotional problems and frankly was scared. And some people display fear by smiling. He really meant no disrespect. He does take this very seriously. Ultimately, the judge agreed to his plea and sent Wright to 25 to 52 years in prison for the murder of Jordan Klee. Donta Wright was sentenced to 23 to 50 years for armed robbery, felony firearm, and second-degree murder of 18-year-old Jordan Klee. While Donta Wright's disrespectful behavior almost sent him to jail, how does it compare to threatening to kill your victim in court? I should have killed you. I should have killed you. Everybody knows you're a liar. Like in the case of Jeremy Christian, who's on trial for murder and hate crime charges in Oregon. 
Reports suggest that on May 25, 2017, Christian went on a hate-filled rant against Muslims, African Americans, and other groups on board the MAX train in Portland. It's like we got a Christian or Muslim bus driver, I'll stab you too. When Demetria Hester, a black woman, protested, Christian followed her off the train and assaulted her. He's looking at me and telling me I'm about to get it now. What do you do? Walking. What's about to happen here? He throws the bottle to my eye. CCTV footage caught Christian throwing a bottle full of water at Hester, injuring her eye. Christian, who had been drinking and smoking marijuana all night, boarded the same train the next day. This time, two black teenagers in hijabs were the target of his racist slur. 16-year-old Destiny Mangum and 17-year-old Walia Mohammed. When other passengers intervened, Christian turned his aggression toward them. A bystander captured the whole incident. The situation got heated, and the three men got into a scuffle. This is when things went horribly wrong. Christian ended up fatally stabbing 53-year-old Army veteran Ricky Best and 23-year-old college student Talisan Namkai Mechi while seriously injuring Micah Fletcher, the 21-year-old poet later survived. Christian then stormed off the train, brandishing his bloody knife. Police soon arrived and arrested Christian, who went off on a sensational rant. He even threatened authorities. Finally, a mask was put over Christian's head and he was taken to prison. Christian was charged with murder, attempted murder, and hate crime assault. At his trial, an emotional Walia Muhammad held back tears as she recounted the horrors she faced at the hands of the defendant. Was there I didn't any... say kill yourself. He was saying Muslims. Saying go back to Saudi Arabia. Survivor Micah Fletcher also took the stand, testifying how Christian stabbed him in the neck after being confronted. How did he respond? Oh, he responded by stabbing me in the throat. Say it again? He responded by stabbing me in the throat. Eventually, the jury found Jeremy Christian guilty on all counts. At his sentencing, Demetria Hester had some choice words for Christian in her victim impact statement. This is when he exploded. And to Mr. Jeremy Christian, your mom should have swallowed you. You are a waste of breath. And when you die and go to hell, I hope you rot. See you there. <laughs> no, hey. Go back what to I, Tennessee, no, too. You, what do I tell go you? Go back to Tennessee, too. You can we don't want you here. Oh, All your race state. As he was being taken out of the courtroom, Christian threatened to kill the victim. I should have killed you. I should have killed you. Everybody knows you're a liar. Everybody knows you're a liar. I swore on my name. 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 I swore on
He was later given a chance to make a statement via video feed, where he refused to take any responsibility for the stabbings, and instead blamed it on the people who confronted him. I shoved two people who confronted me while I was sitting in my seat, and I said, what are you going to do? We're going to fight, we're going to fight, but I'm not backing down. That's what happened. They wanted to fight. Maybe not kill me, but they involved themselves in the situation. Ultimately, Christian was sentenced to two life terms without the possibility of parole. While Jeremy Christian's courtroom rants were truly sensational, what happens when a judge has to chase after the suspects? Like in the case of Tanner Jacobson and Cody Howard, who were in the Lewis County Courthouse for driving on suspended licenses. Just as Judge R.W. Buzzard was about to address them, something unexpected happened. Handcuffed and dressed in prison uniform, the two defendants made a run for it. Handcuffed and dressed in full jail garb, they took off. First Cody, then Tanner. Without a second thought, Judge Buzzard sprang into action. Outside the courtroom, the prison shoes got the better of Howard. The judge followed the two suspects down the flight of stairs and caught up with Howard just as he was about to escape. Jacobson fled on foot for a few blocks before coming back to his senses and surrendering. I only get like four blocks and then I stop. Like I just stopped on my own. I'm like, what am I doing right now? The reason behind their actions? Your guess is as good as theirs. It was just a split second like decision. I don't even know why I did it. Like I would be out of here if I wouldn't have ran. I didn't try to escape to get out. I tried to escape to get well and I tried to do what I could, you know, do what I could do to get my drug addiction. Initially facing only a 30-day jail sentence, the two ultimately ended up with significantly larger prison terms. While Tanner Jacobson and Cody Howard's moments of insanity earned them more jail time, what happens when a convict and his victim's father share a powerful moment? Thank you. Like in the case of Trey Relford, who was on trial for murder in Lexington, Kentucky. Reports suggest that in April 2015, Relford murdered 22-year-old Salahuddin Jitmud, a pizza delivery driver, at an apartment building on Trent Circle. Jitmud was stabbed to death at an apartment on Trent Circle in April of 2015. Police said the 24-year-old suspect led Salahuddin to the apartment complex, robbed him, and stabbed him to death. Relford later pleaded guilty to charges of murder, robbery, and tampering with evidence. At his sentencing, Salahuddin's father, Sombat Jitmud, a school principal and devout Muslim, took the stand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. He stoically addressed his son's killer. Trey Alexander Relford, I feel so, so sad for you that uh, you have to be in this situation. I wish I could help you, as I help my son to be a good citizen. If Salahuddin were to be here, if he are alive, he would forgive you. That's the way he was. That's the way he is. I'm not angry at you for being part of hurting my son. I'm angry at the devil. I blame the devil, the devil, who misguiding you and misleading you to do such a horrible crime. No, I don't blame you. I'm not angry at you at all. I want you to know that. I forgive you on behalf of Salahuddin and his mother. Everyone, including Judge Kimberly Bunnell, was overcome with emotion, so much so that she had to call for a break. I think this may be a good time to take a break. <laughs> Thank you. When court resumed, it was the defendant's turn to say a few words. Mr. Relford, do you wish to make a statement? 
Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry about what happened that day. But I do applaud you because it takes a powerful man to know that somebody has hurt them and do what you get up there and say what you just said. I have a child. She is four. And I can't imagine the hurt, the pain. The two men on opposite sides of justice then shared a powerful moment of embrace, giving the emotional courtroom and everyone who watched later a lesson in forgiveness. <laughs> now it was time for Relford to learn his fate. Mr. Relford, an incredibly horrible event happened. It has changed the lives of two families forever. Nothing can fix it. I am going to accept the Commonwealth's recommendation. Murder, 25 years. And I truly wish for you the very best. Thank you. Ultimately, Relford was sentenced to 31 years in prison for the murder of Salahuddin Jitmud. While Trey Relford's trial ended on an emotional note, what happens when a convict makes the entire courtroom laugh? How have I done as a judge today? How, so far, how am I doing? Not bad, but you could do better. Okay. <laughs> like in the case of Dolores Shyness, an 80-year-old woman who appeared at Broward County Bond Court in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We've got uh, Messi, Dolores, Shyness, Shyness. Shyness ended up in jail for resisting arrest after violating a restraining order filed by her ex-husband. Ma'am, you've been charged with resisting arrest and violating an injunction. Judge John Hurley soon realized he had a feisty old lady on his hands. Does she have uh, any priors? No. Uh, Ma'am, I'm talking to the prosecutor right now, all right? So just give me a I'm moment. sorry. After reviewing the case, Judge Hurley let her go with a warning. Ma'am, I'm going to find probable cause. I'm releasing you ROR to pretrial release. You're going to have a GPS ankle monitor on. That's going to ensure that you have no yeah, contact wasn't that directly <laughs> or indirectly you know. with the protected party, Abraham Shinas. You are not allowed to call him, text him, email him. You are to stay 500 feet from him at all times. That's where he lives, where he works, anywhere in between. Ma'am, you're getting a second chance on this case. I don't, want, I don't particularly feel like keeping an 80-year-old woman in the jail who has no criminal record. But this is your second warning. Don't go around him again. Shyness then stated her case and had a back and forth with the judge. All right. Say something, Your Honor. Go ahead, ma'am. Mr. Mr. Shyness, Abraham Arthur Shyness, and I have been legally divorced for 31 years. Okay. And I have... I have the papers to prove it. Got it. We both resided at 2102 Lucaya Bend, and he paid for the apartment entirely. His assumption is because he paid for the apartment, he's entitled to do as he pleases. Can I tell you? I can't get in the middle of who owns the apartment. I am. I am. I know. I, that's not the point. My the point, point is, I'm telling you. I need to keep you away from him. All right? I haven't bothered him for 31 years. Why would I bother him now? That's a great question. Great question. Judge Hurley also complimented the old lady. Ma'am, have you ever thought of doing a stand-up routine? Have you ever thought about that? I did. Well, you, if you pay me good money, sweetheart, I'll be there. I'm really short of funds. <laughs> Ma'am, I got to tell you something. Um, you seem like you have a great wit about you. I do, sir. Yeah, so... I mean, uh, sweetheart, that's the only thing I have. Thank you, I've been called sweetheart in this courtroom since, uh, I guess, Mr. Miller took over. But, uh... Just, really? Just kidding. Does but, that mean you're taking me for breakfast? Making things even funnier, the judge asked for a review. Today. Let me ask you something, ma'am. Yes, sir. Um, how have I done as a judge today? How, so far, how am I doing? Not bad, but you could do better. Okay. <laughs> can, we get a, can we get a drum roll with this? Before leaving, Shyness had one last punchline to deliver. I gotta tell you, you're, you're, you brighten my day, ma'am. All right? That's what the last guy said, and then he sued me. <laughs> the entertainment continued when Shyness appeared in court the next day. 
Oh, hello, sweetheart. You look fantastic tonight. Did you grow a few inches? Because you look taller. However, the case took a darker turn when Shyness' daughter, Beth, took the stand. She's very entertaining one moment, and the next moment she's threatening to, you know, take you down. My mother has mental disability, and she needs a hospital, not a jail. And she needs to be put into a hospital, and I've been trying to do that for six months to no avail in the state of Florida. Ultimately, Judge Hurley decided to send Shyness to a mental health facility. And it's not going to be any harm to you, but they're going to take a look at you and come Today? to a determination. Probably today or tomorrow, and then you'll I would say to today. Court. While Dolores Shyness thoroughly entertained a Florida courtroom, what happens when you get into a wrestling match with a judge? Like in the case of Sidney Newsom, who's facing a domestic violence charge at Pike County Justice Court in Mississippi. Southern District Judge Aubrey Rimes was presiding over the hearing. Newsom initially seemed to be in a good mood as he reviewed some papers, but an altercation with a court officer seemed to agitate him. Newsom was then asked to sign some papers, which the officer presented to Judge Rimes. However, Newsom was not ready to rest his case. He furiously argued with the judge, who promptly asked the officer to remove him from the court. As he was being led from the courtroom, Newsom lost it. First, he grabbed a stack of papers and threw it at Judge Rimes. The officer tried to subdue him, but Newsom managed to overpower her. He then threw a telephone at the judge. This is when Judge Rimes decided to take matters into his own hands. As Newsom threw more paper at him, the judge single-handedly pinned the defendant to the table. Eventually, backup arrived. Newsom was restrained and removed from the courtroom. He faced additional charges of contempt in court and served 48 hours in prison. While Judge Aubrey Rimes literally took justice into his own hands, what happens when the person to deliver the justice is your cellmate? You know what Bunky was talking about his crime, what he was in prison for, children. Uh, I didn't appreciate it, so I killed him. Like in the case of Steven Sanderson, who's facing murder charges in Michigan. According to reports, Sanderson, who was already serving life without parole in state prison for a 1991 murder case, attacked and killed 67-year-old Ted Dyer in their cell. Later, Sanderson gave a chilling confession to police. I first, you know, punched him a couple times. Still wouldn't shut up. Still kept telling me he wanted to explain that he didn't do it, that he was being set up and all this stuff. And I don't know, I just got mad and then hit him and, and then I killed him. When I knocked, I hit him and knocked him out and then I took the shoelaces out of his shoes, tied them together, wrapped it around his neck and strangled him. He eventually pleaded guilty to the murder charge. How do you wish to plead to the second count of uh, murder in the second Guilty? Yes, sir. In court, Sanderson justified taking the life of his cellmate by giving a specific reason. The reason I killed him was because he was a child. Back in 2014, Dyer was convicted of criminal conduct for molesting a nine-year-old girl. He was my bonky and I had found out that he was in prison for uh, child really bad case. So um, that night he was trying to justify why he did it and I just told him to be quiet and he would have to leave in the morning to find a new cell. But he continued to talk about it and try to justify it. So he was a little bit bigger to me so I got down and I 
hit him in his face a few times, and when he fell, I wrapped a cord around his neck and I took his life. As a formality to the guilty plea, Sanderson's lawyer confirmed the basics. But you did in fact kill him. Oh, sure. And you intended to kill him. Oh, sure, yes. At his sentencing, Sanderson addressed the public response he received following the incident. You know, since this all happened, it's kind of been... People think I'm some kind of hero, but I'm actually not. Um, I just, you know, did what I thought was best. He said Dyer's real judgment was yet to come. I've been getting these emails saying that, you know, it's not my position to judge anybody. And I want to make it quite clear that I didn't judge him. You know, I know God is the only judge we have. I've just set the appointment up. Sanderson showed no remorse for his actions and said he would do it again, given the chance. I don't feel bad for what I did, you know. I feel bad for maybe the families, his family or something. But as far as remorse towards him, no. While Steven Sanderson believes he did a good deed by killing another person, how does it compare to twerking in front of a judge? <laughs> like in the case of Calvin Lloyd Griffith, who's in a Florida court facing charges for grand theft auto. Police said 30-year-old Griffith allegedly broke into a local school and stole an employee's car. This video clip shows him leaving the school. 24 hours later, police caught up with him at North Miami Senior High. It was there that officers recovered the stolen vehicle. In fact, they found the keys inside his pocket. Now at his bond hearing, Griffith appeared before Miami-Dade Judge Catherine Pooler. Mr. Griffin is charged with burglary, petty theft, grand theft of a vehicle, and trespass. Yeah. And he's on probation. Uh, he's out on probation, Yana. Yeah, I'm on probation. I'm on paper. Okay. I'll be in here anyway because I smoke weed and cocaine. Before Griffith talked himself into something silly, his attorney cut his mic out. So yeah. As Judge Pooler looked over the paperwork, a muted Griffith continued to try to get the judge's attention. Okay. You're Calvin Griffin? Mr. Schneider has the button pressed. Yeah. Oh, okay. When that didn't work, the defendant took a slightly unique approach. <laughs> <Your Honor. laughs> to everyone's amusement, Griffith started dancing in the courtroom. A less than impressed Judge Pooler showed no emotion and set Griffith's bond at $18,500. He was also ordered to stay away from the school. And there's a stay away order from Miami Edison Senior High. If you should get out, do not go back there. You're not a student anymore. While Calvin Lloyd Griffith impressed everyone else with his dance moves, how does it compare to killing a friend on the pretense of sneaking out? Like in the case of Aiden Fucci, who's on trial for murder in St. John's County, Florida. As per reports, Fucci stabbed and killed his 13-year-old classmate Tristan Bailey in a wooded area not far from where the teenagers lived. A jogger in the neighborhood found a young girl's body, bloody in the neighborhood's woods. CCTV footage showed that Bailey was last seen with Fuji on the night of her murder. And it's going to show the two subjects walking from top left to the top right, and they're traveling in a direction east towards the cul-de-sac of Saddlestone. Later that night, Fucci was seen running away from the area where he and Bailey had gone a few hours ago. You can see that he's carrying something in his hands. Bailey was reported missing by her family, and hours later, her body was discovered with 114 stab wounds. Fucci was brought in for questioning in relation to the then-missing case of Bailey. He posted this Snapchat while sitting in the back of the cop car. He even took a video on his phone. Having fun in a f***ing cop car. Yep. Tristan. What's up, guys? Yep. Tristan, if you f***ing walk out the damn mess in a f***ing cop car, cuz. Just tripping, dude. In custody, Fuji was grilled by his parents. You know, they found this girl, right? Where? In our neighborhood. Down our main street. Is she good? No, no she's not. she's dead. That's why this is very important. It's all on you right now. That isn't my problem. You were the he last, was one, last one seen with her. So right now, it's a lot of is facing you right now, son. That uh, Snapchat that you did was not very smart. Not good at all. Now we have people wanting to burn our house down and our cars down because of that Snapchat thing you did. It's all over. You're all over the internet, and everywhere. 
social media. It is on social media. You'll probably come stay with me after we get done with this. Just for your well safety. This is very serious. It's very serious. This isn't a joke. This is your whole life. Your whole life. And hers. Talking about his parents, investigators found footage of Fucci's mother trying to clean the blood out of the jeans he was wearing during the murder. Smith is seen cleaning her son's bloody jeans. When officers went into the home, they found a pair of wet jeans in Fucci's bedroom. And as we reported earlier this summer, the jeans and a drain in a bathroom tested positive for blood. She was later sentenced to 30 days in jail for tampering with evidence. Police also found Fucci's knife, which he often used to carry in a pond near the crime scene. Given that and the cuts and abrasions on his body believed to have been inflicted by Bailey while defending herself, Fucci was charged with first-degree murder. Let me tell you what you are charged with. You have been indicted by the St. John's County Grand Jury on the charge of first-degree premeditated murder. Fucci later took the guilty plea and apologized to the victim's family. I just want to say I played out guilty. Uh, and I'm sorry for the Bailey family and my family. At his sentencing, emotions ran at an all-time high when Bailey's sister appeared for her victim impact statement. This jar now holds 114 stones, one for each of the 114 stab wounds that my sister had to endure. Did she see you coming at her with the knife? Or did you stab her while she wasn't paying attention? Did she scream out for help? Or was she para paralyzed with agony? Did she cry for my mother? Did she beg you to stop? Did you hear her lungs gargling with blood? Or did you see it in her face when she realized she could no longer breathe due to her collapsed lungs? What were her last words? Did you stay to watch her die? Or did you leave her there in agonizing pain as you ran away? How long did she suffer? Did you watch the life leave her eyes? Aiden Fucci didn't just take Tristan's life that day. He took everything from us. Bailey's mother pleaded with the judge to give her daughter's killer a life sentence. Aiden Fucci, your deplorable actions are unforgivable, and I will pray every day that you stay in prison for the rest of your life. Your Honor, I plead with you. Please do not for one second think that he could be rehabilitated at any point. He is beyond saving. Judge R. Lee Smith said this was probably the most shocking case of his career. I would submit that this case is probably the most difficult and shocking case that this county in St. John's County has, has dealt with. In the 20 years that I have been, or 16 years that I have been practicing law, and the 30 years that I have lived and worked in this all of Northeast Florida, this case is, is one of only a very small few that uh, had this level and this type of impact on the on the community. He added that the crime was highly premeditated and that Fuji was always going to kill to satisfy his sinister desires of seeing someone get murdered. There was a heightened level of premeditation in this case. Based on the prior statements that he made to his girlfriend and his friend, he indicated that he was going to kill someone at which point he determined that it was going to be Tristan Bailey, I don't know, but there was going to be a victim. What is also very troubling is that this crime had no motive. This was not done out of, out of greed. It was not done in retaliation, retribution, or revenge. It was not a crime of passion. It was not a crime that was committed because he felt rejected by her. It was not done in an and a fit of uncontrollable anger. There was no reason. There was no purpose. It was done for no other reason than to satisfy this defendant's internal desire to feel what it was like to kill someone. Now it was time for the 14-year-old killer to learn his fate. I adjudicate you guilty of the premeditated first-degree murder of Tristan Bailey. I sentence you to life in prison. Ultimately, Fuji was sentenced to life in prison for the brutal stabbing of Tristan Bailey. While Aiden Fucci's trial had a lasting impression on everyone involved, what happens when a convict has to ask for God's help in court? God! 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 
The man screaming for a higher power is 19-year-old Damon Kemp, a double murder suspect in Florida. Police said in 2018, Kemp allegedly shot and killed Trey Ingram and Jordan Payton, both 19, at an apartment complex in Daytona Beach. Authorities say Ingram and 19-year-old Jordan Payton were both found dead at an apartment complex Friday evening. A witness heard the shots and called the authorities. Very loud pops, uh, just bang, 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 just very rapid procession. Kemp was arrested and charged with murder and armed burglary. Now at his bond hearing, Kemp was wheeled in, strapped to a chair. Safe to say, the defendant didn't appreciate it. God! 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 Folks in the gallery, you need to hold it down. God! Mr. Kemp? God! Damon Kemp, my name is Judge Orfinger. I'm going to conduct your first appearance. I met you. God! Besides his yelling, Kemp also had a confused expression right throughout the hearing. I do believe that there is probable cause for the arrest. And under these circumstances, I am not able to grant you bond or any form of pretrial release. So you're to be held at the Volusia County Jail, um, and you will be brought before the felony division judge at, a, uh, at the next uh, date on her or his calendar. All right? And with each passing minute, the defendant's face turned more and more frightening. I've appointed the public defender to represent you so you don't have a, so you have a lawyer this morning. And after I've done all that, I determine the conditions of your release if you can be released. Kemp was eventually found guilty of two counts of second-degree murder and sentenced to three consecutive life terms. While Damon Kemp's wild expressions certainly aren't for the faint-hearted, how do they compare to the ghastly appearance of our next convict? This is Esteban Carpio, a suspect in the murder of a cop in Providence, Rhode Island. According to reports, on April 7, 2005, Carpio was brought into questioning for stabbing 85-year-old Madeline Gata in an alleged robbery gone wrong. During his interrogation at the Providence Police Headquarters, a detective left the room to get some water, leaving Carpio alone with Detective Sergeant James Allen. Seizing the opportunity, Carpio overpowered Detective Allen grabbed his service gun and shot him twice before jumping from a three-story window and fleeing. The now suspected cop killer makes a daring escape, breaking through a glass window and plummeting three stories to the ground. The whole police force sprang into action and a large manhunt ensued. Carpio's freedom was short-lived as he was arrested within the next hour. Esteban Carpio is found and taken into custody nearly an hour after his bold escape. Sadly, Detective Allen later died at the hospital. Police mourned the loss of their beloved colleague. And we've lost a remarkable man today. And this city is the worst for it. Jimmy Allen passed in the noblest way possible. He gave his life trying to make our lives safer. He died serving us. He died a hero. The next day when Carpio appeared at his arraignment, the whole courtroom was left stunned. His whole face was swollen, and he was made to wear a spit mask. Carpio's family members were shocked to see his condition. His family is shocked to see his disfigured face. Step up, step up. Not guilty, oh, I'm not guilty. Oh, I'm not guilty, Steven. They accuse the authorities of police brutality. Police brutality. He was mentally ill, and he and he needed help, and we couldn't get him. We tried and tried, and he didn't deserve this. However, an FBI investigation concluded that police did not use excessive force, and Carpio's injuries were from his attempted escape and subsequent arrest. There is no civil rights violation when uh, injuries are um, incident to arrest. Meaning, if he's fighting the police officers, the officers 
have the right to use whatever force necessary to subdue the subject. As the trial went on, Carpio's defense argued on the grounds of insanity. Carpio claims the state denied him due process during that trial. He says he was suffering from mental illness. The prosecution witnesses said that the murder was cold and deliberate. The murder of my husband was a cold and deliberate action. The jury found that Esteban Carpio was not insane at the time of the crime. Ultimately, the jury rejected his plea and found Carpio guilty. At his sentencing, Carpio took the stand and said he regretted his actions. Every day, I face the facts of what I did and what happened. Eventually, Carpio was sentenced to life in prison without parole for the murder, plus an additional 20 years for the assault on Madeline Gata. Esteban Carpio is currently serving a life sentence for Detective James Allen's murder more than a decade ago. While Esteban Carpio's horrific appearance left the whole courtroom shocked, what happens when you kill one of NYPD's finest? Like in the case of Lindy Jones, who's facing gun-related charges in New York. What do you have to say to his family, Lindy? There's a baby who's going to grow up without a father, Lindy. March 25, 2024 turned out to be a dark day for the NYPD, as Detective Jonathan Diller was shot and killed during a traffic stop in Queens. Police say NYPD officer Jonathan Diller was conducting a traffic stop with his partner in Far Rockaway when he was shot in the stomach just below his vest. Jones was allegedly driving the vehicle. Police said two ex-convicts were illegally parked casing a T-Mobile store in Far Rockaway when 31-year-old officer Diller and his partner asked them to move their car. This is when the encounter turned deadly. As the suspects refused to roll down the windows, Officer Diller ordered the passenger to show his hands. Instead, 34-year-old Guy Rivera pulled out a handgun and fatally shot Officer Diller. Officials say they refused to roll down their windows. Officer Jonathan Diller ordered the passenger to show his hands. Instead, the passenger allegedly pulled a weapon on the officer and killed him. Diller's partner shot Rivera in the back and he was taken to a hospital where he's currently awaiting trial. The driver of the vehicle, Lindy Jones, was arrested and charged with criminal possession of a weapon. Police recovered illegal weapons and an alarming amount of ammunition from Jones's car. Police say his illegal gun and an alarming amount of ammunition were recovered at the scene. Records showed a lengthy criminal history of the two suspects. Rivera had 21 prior arrests, including nine felonies, while Jones was previously arrested 14 times and had already spent 10 years in prison for murder. Officer Diller's death rocked his community. Devastated family members and friends found solidarity from the NYPD and the city of New York. In court, hundreds of officers and colleagues showed up in support of their fallen comrade. 100 NYPD officers showed up to support their fallen comrade. According to the prosecutors, Jones claimed he had nothing to do with the shooting and that the gunman was just a hitchhiker. His trial is still ongoing, and if convicted, Jones could spend up to 30 years in prison. While Lindy Jones took the life of a police officer, how does it compare to killing your little brother? Like in the case of Jacob Morgan, who's facing trial after lighting a fire that killed a family member in South Carolina. Reports suggest that 17-year-old Jacob was alone with his stepbrother Joshua Hill at their home in York County when a fire broke out and spread across the house. Firefighters arrived and managed to rescue Morgan, but his 14-month-old brother was not so lucky. Tragically, little Joshua died in the incident. During the investigation, Morgan gave the police conflicting stories as to how the fire that killed his brother started. Morgan was eventually arrested and charged with involuntary manslaughter, third-degree arson, and unlawful conduct toward a child. During a probable cause hearing, the prosecutor said Morgan had intentionally started the fire that killed his brother. The mouse out of the tank to set a fire in the bedroom where the child is in the crib sleeping. A burn pattern that goes from underneath that child towards the door of the bedroom uh, that is caused by likely something, it's a significant burn pattern as he described it. It could have been alcohol, it could have been something else that gets consumed by the fire, but a significant burn pattern shows that there is something said significant uh, and intentional. And at that point, to start fire in that room is hideous and to walk away, not trying to escape from that fire, and immediately starting another fire in the living room, and then to claim it's an accident that it got out of control, that's an extreme recklessness, and that's intent, that's maliciousness. 
that's a definition of madness. And as you walk away from a fire that you've just lit in another room with a small baby, walk into the front room, light that fire, and then leave the residence standing outside watching it burn till it becomes too much to go back to. While Morgan broke down, the prosecutor continued his argument. What fascination with fire to watch that burn, knowing that that child was in there was going to die, and not calling 911, not saving that child when he could have, and not having started the fires in the first place. He has to take responsibility. And so there's much more here than probable cause. So I ask the court to find probable cause in both charges in this case. Despite his silent pleas, the judge ruled against Morgan. This is when he completely lost it. I believe the state has, in fact, met their burden. So therefore, I am going to find that there is probable cause to charge the individual that he found over four general sessions for for more charges. <laughs> Morgan later pleaded guilty to all charges and entered an Alford plea, allowing him to accept the punishment without admitting guilt. At his sentencing, Morgan maintained his innocence. I love my brother. I still do to this very day. He's my best friend. To kill him and be killing the pieces myself. And I just wish I could have gotten to him in time. Ultimately, Morgan was sentenced to 15 years in prison. After serving only seven years, Morgan was released on parole in December 2022. While Jacob Morgan almost collapsed with grief in the courtroom, what happens when a convict escapes from the courtroom? Like in the case of Rayton Woodford, who's in Jefferson County Circuit Court for violating his probation. According to reports, 29-year-old Woodford was previously sentenced to probation for drugs and weapon-related charges. In court, Woodford's girlfriend sat just a few feet away, showing support for her boyfriend. During the hearing, a detective took the stand and testified. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give will be true. Uh, that evening, he was charged with a handgun and uh, narcotics. Um, and if you know, was Mr. Woodford at the time a convicted felon? Uh, yes, he was. The courtroom camera remained locked on the witness stand as Judge Barry Willett announced his decision. Probation revoked in its entirety. Mr. Woodford, I'm going to send you to serve five years. Good luck to you. <laughs> Moments later, the unthinkable happened. There was a flash across the camera as Woodford attempted to make a break for it. His girlfriend could be heard pleading with him to stop. Effort to escape. However, Woodford's escape was unsuccessful. He was brought back into the courtroom by deputies and arrested. Escape attempt unsuccessful. A sheriff's deputy and LMPD officer stop him with a tackle with the help of Woodford's girlfriend. As Woodford was being ushered away, his girlfriend claimed she was pushed and her hair was pulled by a deputy in the scuffle. As Woodford is ushered away in handcuffs, the chaos doesn't end there. Woodford's girlfriend claims she was pushed and her hair pulled by a deputy during the scuffle. Judge Willett then allowed her to address the court. But I didn't do anything wrong and he didn't have to put his hands on me, period. Okay, I've heard you. Then when she started throwing accusations at Judge Willett himself, the judge lost it. But you condone that, right? I'm not condoning any, no, wait a minute, come back up here right now. Don't you tell me I'm condoning anything. I just told you what I observed. You made an effort to stop him from leaving. I appreciate that. But in the thick of it, when your boyfriend is fighting with deputies, people might get pushed out of the way. Woodford's girlfriend faced no additional charges. In contrast, Woodford faced an additional charge of second-degree escape on top of his five-year sentence.